بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين First to all viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a teacher and that was clearly mentioned in the Quran where Allah Azza wa Jal said, يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is going to teach the book. Now, that's the book which Allah Azza wa Jal has revealed to him uh, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was a teacher, he was not only teaching the, the, the Prophet Sallallahu is not only teaching the book like he's sitting with, a, with with some text or something and teaching the students. This teaching of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a life teaching, which means that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his words, his actions, his silence, his movements, his presence, everything was a teaching, and that's how the Sahaba of the Allah learned from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So. When we, when we teach, nobody will probably have, you know, maybe a book to teach. Uh, when we're teaching, we'll, we'll have some, you know, something in front of us to try and teach. But do remember that the Prophet ﷺ, most of his teaching actually was done through his actions. Okay, his actions, what they call harakat sakanat, which means his movements and his stillness. So these were, these were his teachings more than his words, because... If you look at uh, the, the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yes, the Sahaba, عنهم, they quoted from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he said this, he said that. And that's a massive part of his teaching, don't get me wrong. But the reason why I'm saying this is that I want parents out there and I want teachers out there to understand that the primarily 90% of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's teaching, teachings were done without anything said from his mouth. And that's something which we should take on board because... Uh, a lot of us, we think that teaching is only to do with when the moment you, you open your mouth, the moment your student or your child has listened to you, that's teaching. Uh, no, in fact, the Prophet Sallallahu he was observed a lot of the times. They watched him. They saw him. They, like, if you look at Abdullah bin Masood, anhu, he not only describes the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi when he's, when he's speaking, but he's also describing him when he is praying, for example. And that prayer is something which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did in, su- in such a way that Sahaba, they wanted to modi- modify their own prayers to the prayer of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Now, let me just say very quickly, I mean, parents would have uh, seen this in, the, in, the, in their homes. You've seen your own children, you've seen others praying around you. But have you noticed what happens when you as a parent, or when you as a teacher, you're praying inside uh, you know, in, in, in a certain place, and you're praying a prayer of khushu or something which you're devoted to Allah with. So you're going, you know, you, you're praying steadily. You're not praying fast. Your child or your student, they pray fast. But have you noticed the time when they stand next to you and they pray? What happens to them? I can guarantee you if you pray steadily, your child or your student will pray steadily. Also, They'll slow down. Because there's something which Allah has put inside us that is the first thing we, we do when, when we're very young. Yes, we're learning language, but when we're very young, we like to imitate. And that imitation inside us stays until we, 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 we go to our graves. Now, in the first five years of our life, or you could say the first few years of our life, there is almost like almost 99% to 100% of imitation of whoever we see. Whatever we see, whoever we see, whatever we listen to, whatever we observe, we're trying to imitate, we're trying to take it, take it all in and try to bring it in. You know, I'm trying to become that person who I'm seeing. You see children do this all the time. Okay, You see children do this all the time. Now, um, as we grow up, that level inside us of agreeableness or imitation starts to decrease so as we're becoming uh, you know uh, as, as we're getting towards our teenage life as we're getting towards our adulthood life um, you tend to become an independent person who wants to you know set the standards for others to follow but before that don't forget most of us are imitating we're watching we're observing and we're learning and we just we just like a sponge we're just taking it all in anyway this is the primary thing i want to set that Rasulullah did as in when they talked about sabr, when they talked about patience from the Prophet ﷺ, it wasn't a, just a lecture about sabr. There are a hadith about sabr. And if you collect them all, 
you probably say maybe, I don't know, 50 ahadith and so but I'm not, I'm just taking a wild guess. It's not going to be more than, you know, a uh, hundred different ahadith on sabr, okay? How, and this is 23 years of a life, 23 years of a life. But when you look at, at the Sahaba, they were observing the Prophet ﷺ perform sabr, okay? Most of the time they observed him perform that patience. And he was right in front of their eyes. So you look at the hadith, he, you know, they say that Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, that he went you know, in, in his house from one full moon to another full moon to another full moon. This is two months now. Okay, two months. The stove of the Prophet ﷺ has not been lit. So then she was asked, what did you eat? And she says the two black things. And in, Ar in Ar uh, the, the early Arabs, when they said that, they referred to water and dates, the two black things. And that's the only thing they lived on. Now, what is Aisha anha doing? She's observing the Prophet ﷺ. He's as hungry as they are. And the only thing they've got in the household to eat is dates and water. Now they're observing this for two months. And she's looking at the full moon. One full moon came, another full moon, another full moon, meaning two whole months in between those three full moons. And the same you know, situation in the house. It's not like the Prophet ﷺ is going and, and feeling his stomach and coming home and, and, and then you know, uh, seeing his family style. Okay. He had that. Now, this was just not just his household. I mean, the Sahaba observed his patience on a number of occasions. I don't want to go into each detail. My point here, I'm sure you've got it, which is we've got to become the practical people who, you know, the people who demonstrate that for our students. Anyway, time is short. There are a number of things I want to tell you about the Prophet's teaching. So let me let me crack on. And Monana Aziz, whenever you've got a question, you can just quickly uh, interrupt me with, with, with you know, any of your questions. So. One of the primary things about the Prophet's teaching that we find when he's speaking and when he's when he's got students in front of him is he's observing his students, he's observing his audience. Okay, he will speak, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but he's also going to stop when he sees that his students are losing their interest. Now, Subhanallah, this is the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is the best of all creation. I mean, who better can you get than sitting in front of the Prophet and he listening from him? Sallallahu alayhi wa But, you know, the hadith of Bukhari is there that Abdullah bin uh, Masood radiallahu when he went to Iraq, they wanted him to give a lecture every day. He used to come out on Thursdays and give a lecture and they wanted it every day. And then he said, no, it's better I give it once a week because you might get bored. Just like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to look at us and he used to send, he used to look at us and see if he saw the signs of boredom in us, he sallallahu alayhi wa would stop. Subhanallah. So keep that in mind. Another one is the Prophet ﷺ would cut out from conversation and he would sometimes talk about their, their things. Now look, he is a prophet, he's a messenger. His biggest duty is to convey Islam. There's nothing more important than, than that ever. You, you can't take anything from this world away, away you know, from that to, and, and bring it in front of the Prophet ﷺ that he would be diverted from that. Now, he's sitting with the Sahaba. He's talking to them about ahadith. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all of a sudden, he says, how's your farming coming along? This is in several, had, how, how's your farming coming along? Now, why is he doing that? Because he's seeing that, you know, let's have a break off. Let's, let's not make this a, a long piece of speech, which the, the Sahaba are going to sort of drift off because it happens, especially with children, they will drift off. Even with adults, sometimes when it gets too long, you want to drift off. And sometimes you might just feel, okay, you know, you, you've heard this and, and the effect of it is going. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, most of the times he would give speeches that were short. Okay, they were short. His words would be very measured. They would be, uh, he would separate his words from one, uh, to, from, from, you know, one word from another word. Uh, and Prophet, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would repeat what he's saying three times so that, you know, his idea was that he wanted his students to absorb what he said and convey to others. So therefore, he would repeat it three times. Now, there's a big difference between uh, a person who is a wise, who's, who's a lecturer, and a person who's a teacher. There's a big difference here because a teacher will repeat again and again and again and again because the teacher's uh, whole, you know, ho whole purpose is that these words remain inside the student. Okay, So you repeat. You repeat not 
on the same occasion, but you repeat different occasions. Okay, even Allah did that in the Quran. And if you look at the words of Allah in the Quran, He said, "Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir, inna Hu ala kulli shayin qadir, wallahu ala kulli shayin qadir, inna ka ala kulli shayin qadir." Why is Allah saying, you know, repeating the words that Allah is the most powerful? Uh, you know, over everything, he can do er- everything, and then he says, "Indeed, Allah is the most powerful." And then Allah s- makes us say, "You, oh Allah, you're the most powerful," and and so on and so forth. So the thing is that why did Allah repeat this so many times across the Quran? Even the word "Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir" or the phrase "Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir" is mentioned again and again. Why? Because this is teaching. Teaching is when you repeat things and you instill it inside people's people's minds. It stays there. Whereas a person who's just lecturing will say it um, you know we'll just say it once and he wants to say something new something that he will impress his audience that's something different a da'i or one who's calling someone towards Allah if you're a teacher and you're calling your students towards Allah if you're a parent and you want your children to be towards Allah you're going to repeat and there's nothing wrong in repetition and the things that you repeat the most those things stay with you for life now let me just um, ask you as, as an audience just think you know those things that your mother said over and over again, your dad said over and over again when you were young uh, or an uncle or someone that you stayed close to? You know those things that they said over and over again? They stick. They play in your mind even, t- even when you're old. Why? Because it was repetition. It wasn't, you know, there are certain moments, okay, it was said once and because of the moment, you remember them. Okay, it was said to you once. Now, Rasulullah did that also, but that moment has to be captured. So what did the Prophet do according to a hadith of I think it's Tirmidhi, where Rasulullah is on a conveyance and Abdullah bin Abbas is behind his back and he says, Ya Ghulam, O oh child, inni u'allimuka kalimat. I'm going to teach you some words now. You know, remember these words now. Abdullah bin Abbas says that, you know, I, I was behind the Prophet You know, can you imagine? He's behind the Prophet on a conveyance like a camel or something. And they're taking a ride. And these are moments he's not going to forget because it's out of the norm. So if you're thinking that classroom teaching, classroom teaching goes, you know, over and over again, you know, one of the things that w- w- with all of that is that because the classroom is the same class, same place, or maybe your house is the same place, and you're trying to get the message through your children or your, or your students, what happens is because of the environment, because of, you know, the same place, same person, same, same kind of thing coming through, they kind of, you know, find it, just repetitive or just find it you know, normal, you know. So you want to break off. So take, when you're on a journey with your child, when you're in the car with the child, you know, just you and the child, one-to-one, that's the moment you say something. You know what? They'll remember that because it was it was something different. You broke off from the norm. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to do that. Okay? In fact, if you look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi teaching, he taught with examples. He didn't just teach with just words. He taught with examples. Now, there are people questioning, uh, you know, out there, they're saying, oh, what's the point of these smart boards or what's the point of, you know, us using these um, teacher guides or trying to make the lesson very interactive? What's the point of Allah? Well, guess what? The point is, it's the sunnah of the Prophet So let's, let's, let's quickly delve into that. So the Prophet has been sitting with the Sahaba. He's sitting on the ground. It's outside. He takes a, a stick. And he draws a line. He draws a line on the ground. And he says, this is Sirat al-Mustaqim. This is the straight path. And Prophet Muhammad draws lines that come to the right, come to the left, off of that straight path. So the straight path that he drew on the ground, and then he's got other lines coming off on the side. And he said, these are other lines going off the straight path where shaitan is standing on every one of them. Okay, At the end of every one of them, calling you to come away from the straight path. Now, imagine this. Prophet Allah is using a, a kind of a twig, a stick, whatever he found, and is drawing on the ground. And there are several hadith like that, that he drew different things on the ground as an example for his sahaba to, to, to be captured by the moment and to also have something visual, okay, that's got something visual, and it's also teaching them something, subhanAllah. I mean, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in autumn, okay, he's standing next to a tree, a branch, that, that the leaves are falling off, and he takes a branch. And then he shakes the branch and the leaves fall off the branch. And he says to Salman, he says, oh, Salman, are you not going to ask me what I'm doing? Okay, so Salman's watching him. He's taking a branch. And the Prophet just shook the branch and the leaves are falling off the, off the branch. And then Salman says, okay, Messenger of Allah, why are you doing what you're doing? And the Prophet then explains that 
When a Muslim prays five times a day, that's how his sins are falling off his body. Okay, the way these leaves are falling off his branch. Now look at the look at the moment. Look, he's teaching something with an example of an actual, you know, physical thing right in front of, uh, you know, Salman. And Salman's never going to forget that because it's with an example. And we, th- th- there's two things that really make us, you know, remember something. Okay, you gotta you gotta not just give just a lecture or something. You've got to try and tie it with something else. So tie it with a story or tie it with an example. So examples are called mathal or amthal in the Quran. And Allah has said in the whole Quran, وَيَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ الْأَمْثَالَ لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Allah gives the examples of similes or gives examples of certain things in the Quran. He might, he might talk about fire, okay? How that fire is giving warmth or he might talk about lightning in the Quran. It's in the Quran, okay? Lightning and how... The person walks when there's lightning there, he sees the light, but then he stops because of the darkness. And Allah has given the example of a munafiq, of a hypocrite. Now, very striking, because when you look at that example of lightning and you look at the example of, of, of the munafiq walking or stopping, you know, there's fear inside him. And you kind of think, wow, munafiq, he's, he's seen the Quranic verse, you know, he's heard the Quranic verse that's come down. It's, it's you know, he's moving along with it when he sees but then he stops because he's not believing in it. He's okay. That that was a, a, a just a moment for him. He's not seeing the light for what it really is. He's just going by, you know, what his what his own, you know, inside his inst- instinct is telling him. But he hasn't got iman inside him. There's a lot to take from there. Or Allah gives the example of a spider. A spider in the Quran, Surah An Kabut. Spider, okay. Spider spins a web, okay, and this web is is there. But the web, Allah says, is a house. It's a house of a spider. So yes, we all know. Spider has got his house and the web is going to catch all the flies and so on. But Allah says, buyut The weakest of all houses is the house of the spider. And you think to yourself, wow. Just before that, Allah talked about en- enemies. He talked about Fir'aun. He talked about Qarun. He talked about, you know, he talked about the big enemies that, that, that came, you know, great enemies that were, that, that were uh, in front of the prophets, alayhi salatu salam. And they built this gigantic sort of, you know, monstrous um, sort of uh, empire that surrounded the prophet. Okay? And Allah then gives the example of a spider and a spider's web. Why? Because Allah says, okay, they might have spread it all out and it's all around you. But you know what? It's weak. So it's, there's a lot of thinking that goes on with this Amthal. Another one is stories. So the Quran is full of stories and the stories of the Anbiya alayhim salatu salam. And the Prophet وسلم, also related stories to his Sahaba. Through stories, we can, we can give morals. And those morals from the stories, not just the story itself, but you've got, to, you've got to put the morals with the stories. Anyone who's interested in the lives of the Sahaba and the morals and the lessons we can learn from those. I mean, I've got a um, whole uh, series of lectures just on this on YouTube. Um, it's called Analyzing the Lives of the Prophets. Okay, so if you just check that on YouTube, you'll find it. There's about 73 or 74 uh, different videos going from Adam alayhi salam to Isa alayhi salam. Uh, and it goes through morals of the stories that are there. And there's a lot to learn from this. Anyhow, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he taught the Sahaba radiallahu anhu you know, and, and, and when he taught them, there, there are times, look, there are times when, let's just say, for example, he's getting challenged. He's, how, did he, how did he deal with the challenges that he had with, the, with his Sahaba? Because at the moment, uh, at the one hand, the Prophet ﷺ had to be open so that any Sahabi could ask any question. So he had to be gentle. He had to allow for conversations to, to, to you know, come across. And they could ask, you know, whatever. Sometimes it got very challenging because they, they asked questions that they shouldn't ask. So how do you deal with that? Well, the Prophet ﷺ went silent. Sometimes he went silent. And, you know, if they saw that the Prophet ﷺ is moved by the you know constant questioning and the and 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 then asking questions that are really not even relevant because that, that can happen. Prophet Allah just stayed silent, didn't answer, moved on to something else, or they saw this redness in his face and they realized that they've gone too far. Okay? They've realized they've gone a bit too far. Now again this is all ways of Prophet Allah keeping control of his class, we can call this a class, I mean, it's in the masjid, it's in a halafah, fine, this is his, his class. But the Prophet never rebuked them. He never, he never 
you know, admonished them in that way. He never uh, blamed them. He never criticized them. And this is a very important part of a teacher because once a teacher, or let's say you're a parent, and you, you start criticizing and blaming and blaming and so on, then what happens is the, the, the child or the student, they'll, they'll, you know, shut off from you. They'll, they'll say, you know what? Okay, fine. Let this person do what they want because they're, they're older than me, okay? So here you are, towering person, and they're small. They're looking up at you, and they're getting told off for something probably they've done wrong, okay? But they're getting told off, and what they've done is they've shut themselves off. They're, they're, they're cut off. They're not now listening to you. They don't like you. Now it's become something where they feel like, you know what, your emotions uh, are to their emotions are making them feel such that they're feeling that you're not a person they like. And they've drawn that conclusion in their head wrongly, but they've drawn it in their head. Now, what, what are you going to do about it? So let's go to Anas. So Anas is like, he, he was a person who was like a child in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time, uh, he, was, he was a khadim, he was a servant, but he, he was almost like a child because Anas was a young child and he was a servant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he served him for 10 years in Medina and he could go into any of the houses of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So let's say, for example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in Aisha Radiallahu Anhu's house. Anas could go inside there anytime he wanted because he was a young child. If Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to Hafsa's house then Anas could go there and he could serve there. Now, Sometimes when Anas is serving, he's got a utensil in his hand. Maybe it's made of, you know, it's made of something that's going to break. Okay, China, whatever it is. Okay, some some pottery or something. He's got something in his. It's like a like a plate or something. He's got in his hand. Now it's going to break if he drops it. And by accident, you know, he's a young young lad, and by accident he drops it, and he falls onto the ground, smashes into pieces. And the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are now reprimanding Anas. Anas, you know, be careful, Anas. Anas, what are you doing, Anas? You broke it again. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at that moment would say, leave him. For it's a time for this item to be broken. It's broken. As in, look, what are you going to do by blaming and scolding a child that's broken an item in the house? What's it going to do for him? Is he going to bring that plate back together again? Is he going to bring that broken glass together? Or can he or she turn around to you and say, okay, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go and fix it or something. There's, there's nothing to fix. It's broken. It's finished. It's the end of the life of that utensil. Allah, you know, uh, he, he wrote a life for that utensil. It's gone, finished, just throw it away now. But for the child, what can you do for the child? Well, don't blame them. Teach them how to be upright, honest about you know, something they've done wrong. Because if you're a parent or a teacher and you blame and you scold them, I can guarantee you, number one, they're going to close off on you. Number two, they don't want to ask you anything. Number three is they just want to pass by you, you know, like they, they really don't want much engagement from you, okay? And the worst is, the worst of what you've done uh, to that child is, that child is someone that's going to grow with feelings, negative feelings, about you, even though you might have been a good teacher, you might have been a good, good parent. And what you could have done, you could have taken the moment to make it into something positive. So let's look at the Prophet. He's, he's got Anas. Anas is telling, you know, people are people might tell Anas to, you know, why have you, why hasn't he done this? Why did he do this? You know, when you address a child or a student and you say, Why have you not done this? Why did you do this? You know, that straight away, that why, whatever follows after it is blame. It's blame. Okay, it doesn't matter how you slice the cake. When you tell your student or you tell your child, "Why did you do this?" or "Why did you not do this?" straight away, there's a whole element of blame. Okay, what would the Prophet Allah do? So there's a there is an incident that Anas himself records, which is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him to go to the marketplace and to get something or to do something, and Anas Allah who you know, he just said, you know, I don't want to do it. It happens, look, it happens. You know, you're just not in the mood. A child's not in the mood. I don't want to do it. Now, Rasulullah understood this wasn't disobedience. Okay. Now, please mark clearly what is disobedience from what is, just the moment of someone saying that, I'm just not in the mood of doing it. And we know we don't want a child to keep on saying to us, I'm not in the mood of doing it. I'm not in the mood. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. We know that's bad. Okay. We know. 
Or we know also if there's disobedience, I'm not going to do it because I want to disobey you. That's bad. Now, Anas who wasn't doing either of the two things. He was a very uh, you know, polite uh, and a very obedient child. And he would do what the Prophet said for him to do. But one occasion, he said, I'm not going to do it. Did the Prophet say to him, why are you not going to do it? I'm the Prophet. I've told you. I'm your guardian. I've told you to do it. Now go and do it. No, the Prophet allowed him to be. And Anas went and he, he found some children playing and he joined those children and he started playing with them. Prophet allowed him to play. Okay? And when Anas finished, the Prophet came up to him and he said, Anas, are you now going to do what I told you to do? And Anas replied, he said, yes, Allah, so Allah. And he went straight away and he did what the Prophet told him to do. Now, look at the Look at the Prophet ﷺ. he's allowing Anas to, to break off a little bit. It happens sometimes. You know, he's, he's calculating clearly, is it disobedience? Is it something which Anas now doesn't want to, you know, serve the Prophet ﷺ? No, it's none of those. He understands he's a child. He just wants to break off for a little while. He allowed him. And then look at the way he addressed him. He didn't say, oh, Anas, you, why did you not do what I told you to? No, that's blame. Prophet ﷺ, turned it to something positive. And that's what I'm trying to tell you that when you're talking to children, when you're talking to students, instead of taking it to something negative, which is blame, you can take it to something positive. So Prophet simply said, Anas, are you now going to do what I told you to do? That's it. So just concentrating on what needs to be done, not on what wasn't done, because what wasn't done is blame and criticism. Prophet is just concentrating on the positive. And subhanAllah, you know, this is, this is the... This is the teaching of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So let's look at another example. A Sahih Hadith, uh, I think it's in Bukhari, where a woman, she lost her child. She's emotional. She's, re she's really, really emotional. Her, her baby son had died. Now you can imagine what would go through a mother at, th at that time. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approached her and he tried to console her. And the woman in her hysteria, in her moment, she didn't know who it was. She just straight away started rebuking, rebuking the person and saying, what do, you, what do you sort of understand about what my loss is? And Prophet saw her reaction and he simply just left. He is the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa He's trying to console this woman. And the woman reacted like that. Now, what would you as a teacher, what would you as a parent do at that time? Look, your child's emotional. They're probably, you know, crying at that time, uh, whatever, right? You're going to go and lecture them at that time. You need to wake up, my friend. Lecture's not going to go in. You know, your good words are not going to go in because now emotions are high. The person has shut off their logical faculties, okay? The, your child is not thinking straight. They're very emotional. So the Prophet Allah approached that woman, tried to console her, and she rebuked the Prophet So the Prophet just, just walked away. He went, you know, to, to his quarters. And then somebody later said to the woman, do you know who actually tried to console you? And she said, who? And the person said, it was the Prophet Wasallam." And she was so shocked. She got up, she went straight to the Prophet Wasallam, and she apologized. Did the Prophet Wasallam rebuke her? Did the Prophet tell her off? Did he reprimand her? No. He simply consoled her. Now, what happened in this moment? The Prophet ﷺ, he acknowledged that the woman is going through emotional distress, severe distress. At that moment, she's not ready to take nasiha or to take, you know, good counseling. The Prophet ﷺ just stopped in his tracks, walked away. As in, the moment's going to pass by. The emotion's going to reside. The emotion's going to come down. And once the emotions come down and they are who they are, that's when you speak to them. I remember once my, my, my daughter, she, she became very emotional with me. Um, and it, it was basically, she's sitting on my lap and she just sort of, you know what the kids do? They just fall back and you've got to catch them. Okay. So she's doing that. I'm on the sofa. So I'm catching her and she's about three or four years old. And she's doing that again and again and again and again. And they love it. Okay. They love it because they're falling back and daddy's going to just catch her. And I, um, did that for, for, for a good while. And then I said to her, I said, look, I'm getting tired. I'm really tired. And if you carry on doing that, you're going to fall because I'm not going to, I'm not going to hold you. Look, I'm telling you to stop. Okay. So I told her to stop, I told her to stop, and, and she wasn't stopping. 
and she did it again and 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 she felt not that she hurt herself but she you know she got very emotional with me oh you know daddy doesn't love me right? that was a, that was a that was a, a statement and i just let her be because she was very emotional she got hysterical she really started crying daddy doesn't love me anymore and so on and she went up to her room and she started crying 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 and i let her carry on crying till she she stopped i saw her a few hours later and i said next time look just 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 listen to what daddy says look i i i held you so many times uh, and it was a, it was a game we were playing fine but i got really tired my arms are aching i told you as well not to do it the next time i do that just listen okay don't get emotional and she took that very well because after that she never repeated again now when you want to reason with a child ch- child you you got to have the the right moment to get through to them and even if you see them doing something wrong what you don't want to do is tell them off straight away in front of others now let me give you an example of this from rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's seerah and his sunnah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went to a marketplace and he used to go after asr to the marketplaces and and he used to sort of observe uh the the market you know just to see how sahaba are trading how they're dealing you know with the same products are they cheating and so on just to just to keep an keep an eye on things and he did see a sahabi cheating in the marketplace so what the sahabi did is that he had fresh dates on top and he had dry dates um at the bottom so dry dates are something less expensive and fresh dates are more expensive because they're fresh and they're juicy and the sahabi what he was doing is that he was advertising the fresh dates but as he was scooping up he was scooping up some of the dry dates with the fresh dates and putting it straight into the bag and of course this is cheating but he's he sort of last month observed it he's in the marketplace there are many other s- stall you know keepers there the sahaba with him as well does he tell him off right now no he doesn't prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam just went back to the masjid and he waited for that particular sahabi to be in the audience and when he was in the audience the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam simply said man ghasha falaysa minna whoever cheats and deceives they're not from us now look at this he's giving a common speech to all the sahabas so all the sahaba going to think thinking okay whoever cheats so have i cheated so it's a common common thing but at the same time the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam why he didn't do is he didn't embarrass the sahabi in the marketplace but that sahabi definitely got the message so if you got a few children one of them has done something wrong you don't have to embarrass them in front of everybody else you know there are moments sometimes you might have to pick on something but the the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam his way was that he approached them in such a way that they all loved it this is going to be the big one thing i want to say to you as as teachers and as parents which is there's a fine line between you trying to uh discipline your child and and the, and and you maintaining the love of the child so let me ask every one of you who are listening you've all got a teacher or a parent or it might not be a parent it might be a guardian or it might be an uncle or an aunt or someone from the elders who were who were well, when you were young they were elders you got one of them who you feel hated you no matter what they you just felt like they, they this person doesn't like me and you've also got a teacher or a parent or it could be a guardian or could be a a uh, an uncle or an aunt that you felt you know what this uncle loves me this aunt loves me even though when they're telling you up you know from your heart you know what i know they said it because they love me they told me off yes i know they told me off but they still love me you know that thing inside you i'm sure 100% every person that is into me you've got one person on, on of either either side either of the examples that i've given you now what am i trying to tell you here you've got to be sincere in you trying to discipline your child or your student and the feeling and emotion that you have must surpass and go through straight through to your student and it will whether you like it or you don't end of the day they will have passed a judgment in their heads of whether you're a person who likes them or doesn't like them now they could be wrong in their estimation but guess what who put those feelings in their in them it was you it was your attitude it was the way you approached them it was the way you scolded them when you scolded them where you did it where you blamed them how you did it look did you do it in private 
Did you make them feel bad just for the moment, but then you surrounded you with love? Now, what did Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? They said about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that if he became angry, there was a red, uh, there, there was redness in the face, but there was a vein that was that used to swell right in the middle of his forehead. And they, they also described that it was almost like you took the juice of a pomegranate and you, you, you just squeezed it into his cheeks. That's how his red his cheeks became. But the moment passed, which means that if you just stay silent, if you, you know, they couldn't see eye to eye with him at that time, subhanAllah. You know, the Prophet ﷺ was there, he's angry. And this is the best teacher. This is the, this is the, the, the person who they love the most. Now, these are students, his family members, his, his own children. They love him. They love him like no other person. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he became angry at that moment, the moment passed and straight after that, he showed his original love. Now we've got a famous hadith about Aisha Radiallahu Anha. You know, she's in, uh, you know, she's been accused of something very horrible uh, in Medina. Hadith in Bukhari. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's usual sunnah would be, he would come in the house, he would peck her on the cheeks, he would, uh, come in the house, sorry, say salam, and pick her on the cheek and then say, Our Aisha, how are you? This was the normal son of the Prophet. And he would have a smile on his face, of course. Uh, you know, he had a smile on his face, you know, most of the times. Now, during that, those 22 days, when Aisha radiallahu anha was accused of something which, you know, it was horrible. And she was, she was actually innocent. The Prophet stopped for those days being his usual self because he's inquiring, Oh, Aisha, is there anything you want to tell me? Oh, Aisha, is there anything? Happened. The whole of Medina is talking about this. There's, there's bad gossip going around. Aisha radiallahu anha. Now, she says that during those days, that you know, normal feeling of how he approached me all stopped because he's inquiring to find out whether, whether I've done something wrong. And after that, what happened is when Allah gave her, uh, he acquitted her of, of the thing that they accused her of. What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa do? He was his normal self. The normal Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who forever, you know, always came to Aisha Radiallahu Anha, smiling, cheerful, asking her how her day was, pecking her on the cheek, saying salam to her. It was always the same. And with the Sahabi, every Sahabi that might have upset the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew that if the moment passed and he had, you know, he had been angry with you for what you had done wrong, then after, he, after that moment passed, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be normal. That's his normal self. Now, what's your normal self with the child? And how is the child feeling? How you are to them? Because if they feel that you hate them, they're not going to take anything from you. In fact, they're going to store inside them. They're going to have all this, you know, resentment inside them towards you. But if the child feels that, you know, no matter what they've done wrong and you've told them off, they feel like you still love them. They will be yours for life. They're yours. And they're your beloved and you're, you know, they're your beloved and you're their beloved. Anyway, I said quite a lot. Let me go straight away to Q&A if you've got any questions and answers, uh, Maulana. Jazakumullah, uh, Sheikh. Alhamdulillah, as uh, Sheikh Hassan mentioned, we will be having a brief Q&A. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we've had uh, one or two questions so far. So while we are giving you some time to prepare your questions, we'll have uh, Brother Mubin here, who also works closely with Sheikh Hassan Ali, who would like to just present a brief project that uh, Safar Academy, Sheikh Hassan Ali has been a part of of the recent uh, few periods of time, and they would like to just discuss and present that to you. So I'll just hand it over to Brother Mubin. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, firstly, Jazakallah khair to Mullah Aziz and to Al Miswa Academy. Um, so this is a very short segment, inshallah, just to share with you a project that, as Mullah Aziz mentioned, that Safar Academy and Safar Publications have been working on for the best part of three years. And what's amazing is we actually had um, a, a meeting with the Al Misbar Academy senior leadership team to present to them this project. And Alhamdulillah, uh, Mufti Suhail and the SLT um, had some really good questions and were really excited. And it's something that they will now, inshallah, roll out in all of their um, um, their classes, inshallah. Um, so what this is, as we know, as parents, I'm assuming majority of our audience here are parents. We know our children are accessing um, their devices, they're utilizing it for the good and unfortunately at times utilizing it for the bad. So what we have decided to do at Sefer Publications is we want to always try and find resources that take learning Islam to another dimension. And what we're building is 
a digital platform for teachers and for students and also for parents, inshallah. So in this very short sort of five to seven minutes that we have, I don't like to take too much of your time, but I'm hoping I can just give you a very quick overview of our sort of platform that we're building. There is a whole presentation um, which I'll, I probably wouldn't want to share just in the interest of time. Inshallah, in the future, we will organize webinars that you guys can attend. But for now, I'm just going to dive straight in to the actual platform itself. So it's an online learning platform that is based upon a whole gamification um, strategy so that the children are engaged um, completely in their lessons. And not only that, they keep wanting to go back and study. The whole model of edutech, as they call it, um, gamification is a big thing. And hopefully you'll be able to see some of this in this quick overview that I'd like to share with you. So this is sort of what you'd say, the homepage. We've coined the name Journey to Jannah as our whole approach of why we're studying our sacred knowledge. And as parents, I think the key thing that I want to share with you guys is that it allows parents to also be part of the learning experience with their students. So many a times what happens is the students may come home, they've learned some wonderful stuff and they've got to practice um, with their parents. And parents may feel that they don't have the correct knowledge or the correct examples to actually work with their students um, in the best possible way. So here you can see just a few points that is on the uh, PowerPoint that will allow you to understand why it's really important how parents can support their children's education at home. So back to the sort of um, dashboard. This is how the dashboard would look where each parent, each child will have their own access for them to access their Islamic studies, their um, Qaeda activities, and also, inshallah, in the future, Tajweed and their Du'as um, series, inshallah. So I'll just show you one brief lesson that we will be um, sort of demonstrating in Al Misbah. I think the, the uh, strategy that they will be taking is utilizing their wonderful smart boards and using that in their classrooms to engage the students. So this video is one minute 45 and um, I'll just play little bits of it for you to understand and to see how much thought and effort we've put on into this actual platform, inshallah. Some people may not be able to enter Jannah straight away. On the day of judgment, our good and bad deeds will be weighed. If we have more good deeds than bad ones, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us by allowing us to enter Jannah. However, if our bad deeds are heavier than our good ones, we won't be rewarded with paradise straight away. This is why it is super important for us to avoid bad deeds so we can all enter Jannah. Can you think of some bad deeds that we should avoid? As you can see now from this small video, We've embedded direct sort of questions and activities where the children must stay engaged to the content. Um, I've obviously had a little go at this previously, as you can see. Um, and on purpose, I made sort of one mistake. So then it, it gives me a pointer to say, nice try. I've almost identified all of them, etc. cetera. Uh, hopefully you can get the gist of um, the actual uh, platform. I'll continue the video for the next 45 seconds, inshallah. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us that we can make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pleased with us by doing good deeds, even if it is by giving something small in charity. We're just saying something nice to someone and even smiling. We always need to think very carefully about what we do and say and how we behave with others. If we do anything bad, we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. We also need to make sure that we say sorry to anyone that we may have hurt or upset, even if it was an accident. So as you can see, this is like a very short video that is linked to the direct teachings within the Safar uh, publication syllabus. 
But what you have with every bite-sized video is activities linked to that video where it allows a child when they get home after madrasa to continuously practicing for mastery um, of that topic. So it becomes a lesson that becomes ingrained into their sort of knowledge and something they can refer back to. So this is just one exercise that what the children will have. And there's a range of activities. So here it's a very um, simple sort of drag and drop. So on the day of blank, so the child would have to go to the, if it's in madrasa, they'll be going to the screen um, in Al Misbar or whichever madrasa you have, or even on a projector, and they'll be using this. But what's amazing about this platform is it can also be used at home. So this could be a further revision tool that parents can sit with their children so that they're part of the learning experience um, and the learning journey with their, with their children, inshallah. Next, I'd like to show you, that's the Islamic studies side of things that I showcased, but we will also be having our Qaeda um, on our platform. This will be developed um, as part of the Islamic studies. Inshallah, by January, this will be ready. But I just want to show you one quick example of this. So there'll be an explainer of, say, level five from the Qaeda, short harakas and the Dhamma in this instance. And I'm just going to go straight on to the activity. And this is what I think parents would really find it beneficial, how they can support their child's learning, inshallah. Um, so once the screen loads, I'll just run you through the activity and I'll take another one, two minutes of your time, inshallah, and we'll get to the questions. So we just start the activity. So it's, it's very simple, very easy. Which symbol is the Dhamma? So it's up to that child to go to the screen or to the laptop at home and select the correct one. And then obviously if they check this answer, they know that that's wrong, they'd have to go back. As you can see, there's like a minus one. And then if we collect the right answer, they'll get a plus point. So they get coins that are linked into the... Um, where they get points so that they can buy avatars and they can buy stuff for their avatars that they have chosen, which I'll show you later. So this is another example where you can play the audio. So the audio is played. You can listen to it again. And then the child has to choose which is the correct answer. So they will go here and they will check. And Alhamdulillah, that got that right. So that was just a quick overview of the um, Qaeda activities that we have got. I'll just show you this very quick one and we'll move on to the next part before I hand over to Sheikh for any questions. So ultimately, it's a whole gamification approach to learning. Um, there is so much more I'd like to share with you. There's the, the way that there's quizzes done, a bit like a Kahoot style um, to build competition, so much more. With inter interest of time, um, it's not something that I, I, we can share right now. Soon we'll be announcing a webinar where you can see the whole features of the Journey to Jannah platform. Please make dua for the team who've been working sort of tirelessly for, say, the best part of three years behind this. Actually, just before COVID, I mean, it's a way to take learning um, from the classrooms, which we know is very important. It's something that Sheikh Hassan and Safar really, really impress upon that you have to have learning done from sort of teacher to student from kitab to the student, but also we know our children are accessing content online and we've provided this platform or we will be providing this platform so that our parents can join in their students' um, learning experience, inshallah. So with that said, I want to apologize for taking too much of your time. We ask you to make dua for the whole team. So much effort has gone behind it. On the Zoom link, I will send a link. Uh, on the Zoom chat functionality, I'll send a, a link where you can sort of sign up to get the latest information um, about the platform. Um, and again, we ask you for your duas. Jazakumullah khairan for your time. I'll hand over now to Mawlana Aziz Rahman, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khairan for your time. Mashallah, what a beautiful initiative. And mashallah, as teachers, it requires a lot of uh, brain cells to come up with creative ideas. So mashallah, Safa have mashallah, done an amazing job in bridging that gap with this great initiative, mashallah. So, uh, dear attendees, we don't have many time, much time left, so I'm respectfully going to just select um, the most uh, bit, befitting questions to our webinar. Uh, so apologies in advance if we don't get round to some of your questions. 
So, Sheikh, uh, some of these questions, they are revolving around um, such children who are unwilling or very unmotivated. How can a parent um, enforce some sort of motivation or perhaps on discipline to counteract? Because I believe um, from what you are saying and mentioning in terms of you know, displaying a loving character, but if it goes the opposite direction, how, how do we uh, counteract that? And if they're just unwilling to cooperate? So it depends on, on what has been done in, in the past. So if you want discipline to be something which is um, you know, anchoring and which, which works your way, you have to start from a very early age. We're talking about from the age of zero. As soon as they're born and after they're born, after a few days, whatever, we know you've got, to, you've got to keep that discipline going on throughout. So, you know, things like you know, how much attention do you give a child? When a child is given too much attention, uh, they're used to that much attention given to them. And, and, and the moment comes that you don't give them so much attention. Let's say, for example, you, you give the first child a lot of attention, a lot of attention, and then the second child is born. And now the first child is getting less attention. And the second child is getting, you know, their normal attention. Uh, the the um, the first child is going to feel, you know, emotionally deprived, and they're going to start um, throwing tantrums. So anyway, the point is that discipline starts from a very early age, and if you keep it constant, it's all normal. the The problem we face is when you've not been disciplining them uh, uh, over a certain period of time. Um, or you 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 fail to do it, and then suddenly you want to kick in and give them discipline. That's when you're going to find that you know things are difficult, um, you know, d- difficult for you to maintain. So anyway, let's just say for example, there's a parent out there, and it's already happened that like your child is 10 years old or 12 years old, and now you're trying to discipline them, but you're kind of feeling that it's late, but you've still got to do something about it. Uh, the best thing is, look, you've got to reverse the clock now. You've got to reverse the the tide that was there. Uh, but you've got to do it gently. You've got to do it slowly. You've got to let them get used to. Let's say, for example, they they've been used to you being super gentle, super whatever. Uh, let's give it a score. Let's give it ten out of ten. So you are super gentle. You know, super like yeah, yeah. Go and do it. Go and do this. Go and do that. And now they're at eleven, twelve, and now you're seeing, wow, what in the, what on earth have I done? Because this child has not even listened to me. That guy's got no respect for me at all. Now, for you to drop it from ten out of ten attention. Uh, giving them to write down to five out of 10 straight away or four out of 10. Uh, that's going to be very tough for you to, you know, go from 10 out of 10, giving them everything they want. And now you're trying to balance it and say five out of 10, uh, I'm going to give them and five out of 10, I'm not going to give them. For you to even reach that level, you can't get them one, one stride. You have to slowly do it like now drop it down to nine out of 10. Let them get used to it for a little while. Then drop it down to eight out of 10. Now you've got to do slowly, slowly bring them back into line. It's got to be done gently. It's got to be done uh, in a way that, you know, you push a little, but you get a little as well. You know, you try and, you know, get something off them, but you give a little as well. Like that, you've got to come to your, to your stat, you know, to, to your target uh, level uh, of, of discipline. But you can't do it straight away. If you, if with that child, you try and jump straight away and you take it from, 10 out of 10 of what, you know, giving them whatever they want. And suddenly you jump into five out of 10 straight away and you get to your target straight away. It's going to cause a lot of, you know, hate in the child. The child is going to seriously have some anger issues uh, towards you. And, and a lot of parents make this mistake. You can't, you know, go that fast to your target, you know, level of, of discipline uh, if, if you've not been there before. So I hope that makes sense because whatever whatever your child is right now, you've got to bring them back in line. So let's give an example of um, an actual example. You know, I, I see parents you know, come, come to me after the lectures that I do up and down the country. Uh, the other day, somebody in, in Britain uh, said to me, um, uh, my, my child, you know, is, oh, it was their child, who's a, I think it was their nephew, uh, is addicted to um, games. Okay, addicted to games. So I said, how addicted are they? And how old is the child? The child is six years old. And the child is spending like four to five hours a day on, on you know, different devices. Now, already you can see emergency, you know, red flags going up, you know, beeps and sirens and all so on. How does a six-year-old play hours and hours and they're addicted, addicted to it? But it's not too late. So what I told them is, t- told them to wean the child off slowly. So 
if they're doing four hours a day of, of you know, uh, games and so on, you want to move it to three, then slowly move it to two and slowly move it to one or move it to two on one day and nothing another day, two another day and slowly bring it down to one. And then whatever your desired target is after that, maybe it's just, you know, they play on weekends, certain hours. You can do it, but you've got to bring, bring them slowly back to where they are. And they're going to throw a lot of tantrums along the way, but you're going to have to do it. And you messed it up because you gave them the device for so long for, you know, I mean, what, what on earth is a six-year-old doing, you know, with that many hours on, on, on the uh, device or different devices? You're the parent, you messed up. Then now you're going to have to go back and, and correct it, but you have to do it slowly and bring them back in line. Uh, once in America, I think uh, someone told me that 15-year-old, you know, doesn't do anything except just play games five hours a day. Again, it's going to be a lot tougher with a 15-year-old to, to bring them back in line, but you're going to have to start somewhere and you're going to have to give them advice and, you know, take certain hours off and or take some time off or, you know, do something, give them alternatives as well, you know, alternatives of other things they can do to occupy their mind because they're addictive. They're, they're having some, you know, some deficiency in the amount of chemicals that are being released in their heads because of them not playing those, those games. Anyway, pass it back over to you. Exactly. Would you say that the technique of uh, slowly introducing it, when they reach, like, as you mentioned, 15 years, there might be a slightly different approach because now they're reaching, um, you know, they want to be a bit independent, so to speak. So if you give them responsibility, would you say that might be, you know, something? Considered? Well, responsibility needs to be something given to them stage by stage over the years that they're growing up. So let's start off with responsibility of doing your better or responsibility of tidy, putting your shoes away responsibility of washing your plate after you finished eating responsibility of you um, looking over your little brother or your or your sister making sure they've done their their homework you know these responsibilities that come over time slowly or responsibility of you making your own breakfast for example at a certain age you know bring them in slowly into their lives don't bring you all of a sudden you know you've You've done everything for them. They've done nothing to take care of themselves till they're 16, 17, 18. And suddenly you turn around to them and say, get this and get that done. They're not going to do it. They're going to, it's going to be like, I don't know, it's going to be a circus in that house. So responsibility, yes, they will grow up as you give them responsibility. Yes, but you need to give them, you know, give them bit by bit as they're growing up and it becomes part of the system of life to carry on those responsibilities as they're growing up. Exactly. Well, there's a sister, she's mentioned that she's a mother of three. She learned how to evolve as a parent, as a teacher. If you say the question again a bit louder, sorry. Sorry, Marana. So the sister who's just mentioned, she's a teacher and a mother of three, and she's learned over the years to evolve her style of parenting, I believe pretty similar to the kind of style that you mentioned. However, her spouse is the complete opposite. So how would she kind of convince her partner? This is a very big problem. Uh, parents need to be both on the same page. So whatever level you set of discipline for your children, you need to be on the same page, both of you. And you've got to have your private discussion on the side before you bring all that in front of your kids. Because the last thing you want is the mother says one thing, the father says another, and both of them are clashing. And the child sees that, and the child then decides, okay, who's the more lenient out of the two? And based on that, they're going to say, okay, I'm going to go with, you know, this, this, the father, or I'm going to go with the mother because they're more lenient, they're more sort of easy for me, more gentle for me. And this, this really spoils a lot of discipline. And, and it's very unfortunate if, you, if you're in a household with, even if it's a grandparent and they're not on the same page as you, it can spoil a lot of discipline in the house. So I guess the only way to, to go about it is to sit with your spouse and to talk to them and say, look, you know, what you're doing is you're doing. Uh, or, or what, what the level you want is what you level. But let's compromise. Let's come to a nego let's negotiate. Let's come to something that look both of us can agree. This is something that we both need to you know get done for the children. Now sometimes you could have a um, a rule that if the, if the father is disciplining, then the mother shouldn't really intervene at that time. And if she disagrees, she can talk about it later on, but in private. And if the mother is disciplined, then the father you know should stay quiet and then talk to him private and you know with his disagreements and they should sort it out in privacy of, of what they got wrong or what they got right so that it's not all spilling out in front of the child because the child will then see that, okay, here I see there's two different systems. 
And there's one system I could get very comfortable with. That could be my dad's system or my mum's system. So they could easily show favoritism to one parent and get spoiled under that parent, not knowing that they're getting spoiled. And that, that damage is worse because over a number of years when they've got spoiled, one parent is trying to discipline them, you know, the, the, the good way and the other parent has been too lenient with them. And then what happens is after a number of years, the child is, is got, got some serious damage in, in the behavior, in, in the attitude towards life. And they're not really doing what they should do. By the, by the time the child is a teenager, you can see a lot of problems there. And how do you sort that out? It's a real big mess. So I'm going to say to you, sit with your spouse and negotiate with them, talk to them, come to some kind of agreement. And then, you know, live by that, inshallah, whatever best you can do, because you, you, you can't, um, you can't go ahead with, with two systems or two sort of uh, disciplinary levels in one, in one household. Normally children are spoiled but because of that, because they have all sorts of adverse reactions to that. They will end up hating the one who is disciplining them more than the other. Uh, and that person who's disciplining them more may be the one who's doing the correct thing for their good term, long term future, but they can't see that. They can't understand that. So they will sort of, you know, um, end up hating that, that, that person. And on the other hand, they will um, love the person who's probably spoiling them. It, it could happen. Uh, sometimes I do understand that sometimes someone is too strict in the house. That could also be the case. And, and they need to also understand, you know, come to compromise with, with the person who's trying to bring them to a balance. So the balance is key here, inshallah. Jazakumullah. Um... So this sister, I believe she deals with, or she may have uh, children who have some level of disability. Are there any guidances from the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to show how we can cater for children with disability? So disability is something which, you know, may Allah Azza wa give you, um, you know, give you sabr and give you patience. And this is, the best thing to say here is though, you're looking after this child is something that already is probably your way to Jannah. Uh, honestly speaking, uh, you know, may Allah give us all healthy children. May Allah give us all, you know, children that don't have disabilities. But those parents who have ended up with, with some form of disability in their, in their children or in, the, in a child, then that is probably your ticket to Jannah. You just got to, you know, because your whole life, your focus, everything ends up on that one child with those children. And you can't do anything else except just, just looking after his children. And that is your way to Jannah. And that's, that's one of the biggest things I can say to you. And then the second thing is, look, with disabilities, there's always exemptions. So we know from the Sharia that Sharia has told us to do wudu, but when you can't do wudu, then you do tayammum. Sharia has told us to pray properly, standing up, but when you can't stand up, you sit down and you pray. Now with disabilities, they've got the exemptions. And you've got to understand that with every disability, don't compare those children with normal children. Otherwise, you're going to do your head in. So let me give an example. If my child is a slow learner, then I should never compare them with, with normal learners because I'm thinking, oh my God, my child is behind. My child is behind. My... Your child is not behind. Your child is going perfectly well according to their you know, ability and their skills though. So let's give an example. If you, on the road, you had one bicycle on the road and you had one car on the road, we know which one's going to go fast. Now, let's just say you've got several cars on the road. So there's like 10 cars coming past. One, two, three, four. They're all going 30 miles an hour. And you've got one bicycle that is going 15 miles an hour because the guy's on a bicycle. How fast is he going to pedal? Now, are you going to say the bicycle is slower than the, than the cars? No, you're not. You know, as in, is the bicycle losing out? There's no race here. The bicycle is perfectly going well at 15 miles an hour. And the cars are going perfectly well at 30 miles per hour because the bicycle's ability is only to go to, at a certain, you know, um, uh, at a certain speed. So 15 miles per hour is really good for a bicycle. You know, it could have been going 10 miles per hour. But nonetheless, you shouldn't be comparing it to the cars on the road because the cars have got a different engine and their engines allow them to go much faster than bicycles. Now, the same way with your dis dis disabled child, don't co stop comparing them to normal children out there. 
even when it comes to imaniyat, because I know certain uh, you know, parents get really frustrated. My child, you know, they, they don't know, you know, Islam properly. They don't know how to play, uh, pray, pray properly. They can't memorize Fatiha and other parts because of their disability. Now, why on earth are you doing your head in? Why are you frustrating yourself? Because Allah has exempted them. Allah has exempted them. So if a child cannot memorize the normal things that we memorize for salah, Allah has exempted them. Let them say what they can say. Let them say what they remember. That's it. Their salah is done. You know, why are you, why are you making it? Like, why are you going crazy? Oh my God. All my other children, they know all of Juzah This child can't even keep up with five surahs of the Quran. Even then, them four, five short surahs of the Quran. You know what? That, those five surahs, short surahs of the Quran, is the same as them doing the Jews of the Quran, the other children doing the Jews of the Quran, because Allah looks at abilities. Do you think Allah will not cater for children on the Day of Judgment and say, oh, you know what? I made you someone who's disabled, someone who's slow, someone who's got ADHD, someone who's got, you know, learning disabilities or someone dyslexic, whatever. I won't cater. Of course, Allah's going to cater for it. We've got, we've got hadith that, that tell us. Like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, when, I, when a person reads the Quran, they're going to get X amount of reward. But the one who, yatata'ata, the one who's struggling and, and, and you know, that, uh, and struggling to read the Quran, they get double. They get double the reward than normal people. SubhanAllah, so Allah can make it, you know, much more than that if he wants according to their disability. So stop looking at children with disabilities as people, you know, as, as, as people who are back, who are, you know, who haven't performed yet properly and so on and so forth. Why? Why are you doing all of this? Because Allah has, Allah is going to judge them according to the abilities he gave them. Whatever abilities they had, as long as within their capacity they performed, Allah is going to judge them according to that capacity. If they had the capacity only to keep in their minds two surahs of the Quran and they did that, then guess what? That's 100%. They get 100% marks because the capacity can only memorize two surahs of the Quran. Inna they just about remembered that because they were disabled. Just about performed every salah with these two surahs because they're disabled. Then guess what? They get 100 marks because Allah sees the capacity. Another student, you know, if they if their capacity was just, just keeping, I don't know, 20 surahs of the Quran, then that's for them. Alhamdulillah, you know, they get full marks on that because the capacity is 20 surahs. Another one is the full Quran. So, you know, they did that. Alhamdulillah, they get, they get marks according to what they did. Everyone's going to get different marks because everyone's paper is different. Everyone's abilities are different. And Allah looks at and Allah will judge everyone according to their ability. So don't, you know, don't go crazy on, on this thing about looking at, you know, children and comparing them with everybody else. Every other child that you've got in the family, every other child outside that you're comparing them to all of them. Oh my God, you know, my child can't do this. My child can't. Why? That's the problem you bought on yourself. It's, it's already 11.44 a.m. Are you happy to take a few more questions or would it be a bit difficult? We can, yes, we can. Go ahead. In terms of rewarding children, um, this one question says, how to reward a child doing something good other than buying games or PlayStation, etc.? Um, they believe memorizing the surah, learning some ahadith should be rewarded. Are there any ideas? See, the thing is, why are we getting in this whole thing that you want to reward a child with something uh, tangible? That doesn't have to be some tangible. You know, the biggest thing a child loves is your appreciation. They love that more than anything. You know, your happiness, your smile, your way of saying, mashallah, mashallah, may Allah bless you, may Allah give this to you, du'as to them. You know, you're making them feel that, wow, they've, you know, you're you made... You know, they made your day. That's brilliant. Now, even if you're going to say, okay, no, you know, we've done all of that. We give the praise and so on, so on, right? So we want to reward them with something. Reward them with something that's simple. Something simple. You don't have to reward them. Look, let's say, for example, a child's got their favorite food, a favorite chocolate of cake or something, that's some kind of cake they like. Why don't you reward them with that? Why don't you say, you know what? When you get that done, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bake you that cake that you love. I want to buy you that ice cream that you love, right? So get that done. And I'll, I'll get, why does it have to be a PlayStation or a, or a tablet or something? I and mean, why are you going to that level? I mean, these electronic devices as, as, as uh, you know, rewards, 
And they could be damaging in the long term because um, what are they going to do after they receive that? How much time are they going to spend on those things? I mean, I'm not telling you not to buy them games and stuff, but why make that the reward? Why not make reward different things? Like, for example, um, you, you know, when you've done this, you know, I'll, you know, I'm going to go on a, you know, there's a weekend coming up. We're going to go to your, to your, you know, to, to this certain place, right? With a family. It could be a dinner out. It could be something different. It could be a, a, a uh, you know, a, a relative's house that they, the kids love to go to. It could be anything that you want to put, but you don't have to put something big. You can put something normal. Now, be careful on give, giving your children big rewards, something that's going to cost you three, four hundred pounds because of something that they've done. What's going to happen the next time they do something? I mean, how are they going to be motivated if you make it the, the that big reward? Because you, they're going to lose motivation unless you throw in those big things every single time. And then you get your... Your pockets are going to hurt you. Your finances are going to be, you know, looking you in the face and saying, you know, turn back, right? What are you doing? So give simple things. You know, the, like I said to you, the best thing is this mashallah, this, you know, alhamdulillah, this dua. Make them feel that. Spend time with them. You know, one of the things that kids love at different ages as they're growing up is spending time with you, you know, relaxing with them. That time they spend with you, that, that bond they have with you, you know, that is something which is priceless. You can't buy that from shops. You being there with giving them the moment of, you know, some, some game they like to play. You play with them the same game. Go and do that. See how they feel. They feel, they feel like, you know what, you're part of them. And that's more, worth, that's more worthy to them than an item that you buy from a shop and you just give to them. I'm telling you, you, you do that over time. They, they'll, they'll love this. And now, with my children, you know, I did give them certain presents, certain things, things, yes, gifts. But, you know, most of the time, most of the time, it's always been the, the, the happiness that you share with them, the smile on the face, the, the lovely, you know, the martial, come on, give me a hug, martial, you've done so well. You know, if you make that the norm, you know, they look forward to that. They look for, don't make it your everyday thing. Anything they're doing, you're always doing the same thing. No, make it something special you're going to do. And yes, I've given them different, different types of rewards, but not always, you know, to give them something tangible. Something you might do. Sometimes you might say, well, I'm going to buy you something. Well, then put a budget to it and say, I'll buy something of this, of this sort of, you know, budget. Whatever it might be, 10 pounds or something, fine. Then you tell them, get, you know, do this, fine. You know, I'll, I'll buy you, buy you something and now. You can go online and check what you want or go and see this, um, you know, see, see what kind of uh, gift you want and I'll buy that. You can do that, fine. But it, it shouldn't always be tied to something tangible. Exactly. I think we'll just take one last final question, Shadla. How do we mitigate grandparents' care which may not have the necessary discipline that children need and parents end up being the bad guy for setting the rules? That's a million dollar question, you know, that because the thing is the parents are on their way out and they're thinking that I haven't got much time. So I might as well just enjoy the moment and do with my grandchildren what I couldn't do with my children. Because what parents think about children is I've got to get it all right. I've got to get the discipline right. And rightly so, they're doing that. And grandparents should support them. They should support them in, in the parents' discipline. And a good grandparent will say, you know what? I'm not going to step in. The father said, child's done wrong and he needs to be disciplined. Let the father discipline. I'm going to stand with the father. That's what a good grandparent would do. Uh, and um, a, par a grandparent that's, you know, letting it all go will be like, well, yeah, I disciplined you child when you were my child. Now you're trying to discipline your child in front of me. Well, guess what? I'm going to spoil it for you. So I'm going to sort of, you know, be that softy in front of them that they should come to. Yeah, it's not going to do good for that grandchild in the long term because you you kind of see those children get spoiled in the long term and they could show adverse behavior in the long term because they've got this sort of, you know, uh, clash in the house of different disciplines that are coming across or one who's disciplining and one who's not disciplining. So um, what do you do in that situation? Well, I would say to you that as soon as you can get your independence, and as soon as you can, you know, get your own house, get your own, get your own place, get, get, go somewhere where you can stay. Or if you have to stay with, the, with your parents, you know, who are the grandparents of your child, then um, 
talk to them, you know, privacy. Tell them what would have been the case when you were a child, if your grandparents were around and they were spoiling you, but your father wanted you to be disciplined, what would the consequence of that be? And just tell them to look, just ease off and just please stick to their, you know, their little world, whatever's going around uh, on around them. Try and reason with them. That's the best you can do. You can't, you know, you can't push it too far with them because they're your own parents at the end of the day. Uh, how are you going to be, you can't be horrible towards them. All you can do is talk to them, reason with them and, you know, tell them again and again because the, the adverse effects of these children are going to be big. It's going to be too much for you to deal with. If these children of yours and their grandchildren get spoiled, how are you going to ever, you know, uh, put it back right again? It's going to take a lot of effort. So just reason with them. Uh, but, you know, grandparents are grandparents. Oh, you can't, you, there's only so much you can do.